Hello, everybody. I'm going to change my view here. I want to welcome you to our webinar today. Uh, my name is Adrian Mason, and I'm managing editor of Hakai Magazine. And um, our, I'm, uh, our, this webinar is on urban goals, and we're pretty excited to have two excellent panelists with us. Louise Blight is a seabird ecologist and adjunct professor at UVic in the School of Environmental Studies. And Ed Kroc is assistant professor of measurement, evaluation, and research methodology at UBC. And both are experts on goals and are here to answer uh, my questions as well as any that you you um, send us. So I'm going to give you a little bit of housekeeping first. I uh, just want to tell you a little bit about the magazine, Hakai Magazine. We've been um, in operation online for about six years now and we our focus is uh, science and society in coastal ecosystems so i really encourage you if you don't know about us to check out our website and you'll find uh, we post a story a day there it's all free um, um, available to everybody there's no advertising or we're not going to ask you for anything and one of the easiest ways to stay um, apprised with what we're doing is to sign up for our newsletter it comes out on Fridays there's an easy sign up on the website and it's like getting an issue every week it tells you the stories that we did that week as well as sort of bonus content behind the stories um, behind the scenes stories um, uh, suggestions for other stories to read and books and things like that so I think you'll really enjoy that um, so today, the way the webinar is going to go is we're Louise, Ed and I are going to have a chat for about 30 minutes and um, you are welcome to send in questions using the Q&A tab at the bottom of the screen and we have somebody monitoring and feeding me the questions so I'll occasionally be looking away from the screen just to, to see the questions and we'll try to answer as many as we can. Um, for about 15 minutes. So in total, it's about 45 minutes. The, um, the webinar is being recorded, so it will be available on YouTube afterwards. So if anybody is unable to miss it or has to, to zip out earlier, you want to send the link to somebody else who you think would be interested, that would be, um, that's a great way to do that. Um, so as I mentioned, the, the webinar is a follow-up to um, a series of stories we published uh, we called the little package Birdopolis, uh, Coastal Birds at Home in the City, and we focused on three birds that for various reasons were kind of surrounded by the city. One was the uh, salt marsh sparrow that finds itself, it's a fairly um, rare bird in, the, in North America, it's kind of surrounded by New York City and elsewhere on the very populated part of the Atlantic coast, so that, that bird kind of just ended up in the city. And other birds, the two other birds we're, we're going to look at, or groups of one type of bird, the Hawaiian tern, that is uh, finding quite a good success in the city in Hawaii. But urban gulls are, um, many species of urban gulls are finding their way into cities, so a, a variety of species within the, the group of gulls. So it was an interesting way of exploring the, the relationship between urban areas and birds. So we wanted to focus mostly on gulls here today though, so um, but I'm sure if there's other relevant stuff, we might be able to tease some other great stories out of these two. So first of all, I just want to ask Louise and Ed, um, and they've done work, they work together. They um, uh, have done um, one of the st stories that I first learned about, um, which may be interested in this story. And actually, I should say that the story was written, the Urban Gull story, Gold Next Door, which is what we're um, uh, a story that we published in Hakai was written by Sarah Kurtz. And so she did a great job of talking about Louise and Ed's work in Victoria, British Columbia, and elsewhere in BC, as well as uh, to uh, a study in, the, in Bristol in the UK of urban goals there that's um, where they're fairly well established too. So I really invite you to go see read read the goal next door our story if you haven't already done so and it talks about their work but you two both worked on the urban goal story uh in victor the urban um goals that are nesting in victoria and i got particularly interested because they nest on the roof rooftop of the apartment that i live in for part of the year and uh then i saw louise do a chat at uvic so got me very interested in in the whole project so, um, first of all, let's just get this out of the way. There's not just one type of seagull. Who wants to tackle that question? Louise, do you want to maybe take it away? What is a gull or a seagull or should we call them? What should we call them? <laughs> sure, I'll, I'll start and then hand it over to, to Ed with his uh, handy map to gulls of the world on his website. Um, well, 
Sure, I, I'm I'm fine with people calling them seagulls. I think in certain circles, it's uh, considered bad form to call them that. But whatever. I mean, they are technically gulls. They're um, there are more than 50 species of them in the world, and they occur on all seven continents. So they're very diverse. A lot of them are marine, marine associated, but um, not all of them are. Um, they like to nest in, in isolated places, like a lot of seabirds or most seabirds, they let nest on the ground or, um, you know, other seabirds nest in burrows. But anyway, they need to be in places that are isolated from predators. And so there are all the gulls that we know around the city, like the glaucous wing gull, which Ed and I study. But there are species like the gray gull that nests in the Atacama Desert in Chile. So instead of nesting on an island to be inaccessible to predators, it nests in the middle of one of the driest areas in the world, um, completely inaccessibly. And then on the other side of the coin is the ivory gull, for example, that nests in the high Arctic on nunataks and inaccessible cliffs. So uh, a really um, diverse family of birds. Ed, did yeah. you want to add anything? <laughs> I think uh, I think that's that's great. Um, I think you mentioned before, Adrian, uh, just uh, that you know people say, "Oh, I'm, I'm a thousand miles away from the coast. Why am I seeing seagulls here?" And it, it again just speaks to their diversity. I mean, here in North America, we have the ring-billed gull, which you can see pretty much anywhere across the continent, maybe south of the Arctic Circle. Um, so, uh, yeah, extremely diverse and adaptable. Right, right. Thanks. So, um, Ed, what got you interested in studying about, studying gulls? Uh, so, I got interested in them after I moved to Vancouver um, about 10 years ago. And I, I just, I just started watching them outside my apartment window. So, there was a, a shorter building um, just across the street from me. And there was a pair that nested there. Um, just one summer, I noticed them, and I started watching them raise their chicks, and I could see them any time I looked out the window. So over the next three years, I started to realize that these same gulls were there all the time and doing very interesting things. So after a couple of years, I started to think, well, you know, I'm kind of a trained scientist. I come from a stat and math background. So why don't I try to actually learn something from these, uh, from these gulls? Great. Louise? How did I get interested in gulls? Yes. Um, kind of from the um, opposite side of the spectrum from Ed, looking at the urban gulls and connecting with them in a city environment out his window. Um, I have worked on seabirds um, for quite a long time. One of the places I've worked is Antarctica. Um, before starting my, my PhD in seabird ecology, you know, I was working there and, and seabirds and marine mammals are just unbelievably numerous there. And that made me interested in, you know, what, what did the world's oceans look like before industrial exploitation, particularly here in coastal British Columbia, where I live. And so I was looking around for a PhD project that would help me to identify that or address that question. And um, I, I started looking around and realized that there were loads of data, historical data on glaucous wing gulls, on, on gulls in general from this part of the world, partly because people um, have been interested in them for such a long time and because of the history of museum collections here. So people started collecting gulls on the West Coast in 1860 for museums and naturalists and biologists started studying them in about 1900. So there was this huge data set that was available. Gull, gull studies became very popular in the 1960s, 70s, and 80s. There was a lot of work that was being done on behavior at that time. And so really it just, it, this allowed me to stand on the shoulders of all these people that had come in the decades before me, use these historical data sets and add my own data, and then put together a picture of what I was interested in in, in these really long-term changes to marine ecosystems. Great, just thank to you. jump real quickly off of that because yeah. I forgot. It's just totally a coincidence of timing, but when I started to get into goals, Luis had really just kind of done her work, her PhD work, and so I was reading her work too. And she was kind of the first one who was picking up this, this stuff in goals since about the 1980s. So it had been 20-ish years or something. So um, it's kind of fortuitous, I think, but um, certainly to see other people interested in these, uh, these species uh, got me more interested too. Great, thank you. And just to further, uh, I'm just going back a uh, to the first question I asked about the number of species and, and the, the variety of gulls. Um, Ed has a, um, a website with a goal. It was it called Gulls of the World or? Uh, know, uh, know, know Your Gulls. Poster. Know Your Gulls. That's right. I Know Your Gulls poster. And there's also a, a, 
cool map on urban nesting gulls, uh, interactive maps. So we'll post that information in the follow-up email that you'll get after the, the webinar. So yeah, that's a really great resource. So, um, Ed, let's start with you on this one. What's, what is it about uh, gull biology that makes them so successful in urban environments? So I, I think, uh, so certainly this is a question that's better suited for Louise, I think, since she's really a trained biologist. Um, my background is more statistics, but certainly, I mean, what they, they, they're, they're extremely um, plastic, I guess. They're, 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 they're quite adaptable, many of the species, although there are certainly some species um, that we see that are quite sensitive, require very particular types of habitats to be successful, uh, the ivory gull, for example, that Louise mentioned. Um, so, so not all of them. Um, of course, they're so visible to us, and we tend to think of they're all just interchangeable seagulls, um, that they might all seem that they're kind of adaptable. Um, but it is kind of some of just these key species that we see are really successful in these diverse environments like the urban environment. But Luisa, you probably have more to say. Uh, yeah, I mean, I just, I just add that, you know, they're very, um, they're intelligent birds. And one of the hallmarks of um, intelligence is adaptability, well, not adaptability, um, innovation, I suppose, the ability to innovate. So, um, you know, they're, they're able to go and I suppose see buildings as sort of city buildings, city rooftops as sort of islands in the sky and try out nesting there and make it work. Right. Um, is there um, increasing, like I, I, I said, my question says, is there increasing presence telling us something about the state of their natural habitats? But are they actually increasing in the city? Are we just observing them more? Do we know that question? Like, are they, or is there more of them overall? So some of them are moving into the city. I guess it's going to depend on the species a little bit. But do we know? Do we know sort of anything around those those questions? I mean, that was that was the 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 point of the drone study that Ed and I and and our colleague Doug Bertram did in the city of Victoria. So. You know, I mentioned my PhD research looking at long-term trends in the population and, and, and its environment of the glaucous wing gull here. And what, one of the main findings was that the population had decreased a lot from the 1980s. And we knew that it had actually decreased um, from counts at its natural colonies, but also from counts at sea in the winter time. So we knew there were fewer of them. We just didn't know how urban gulls played into the into the into the situation or into the question because I hadn't studied or, or urban gulls we hadn't looked at what their populations were doing and so we decided it was important to go and look at those populations and so came up with the idea of using a drone to census their numbers in the city of Victoria because there have been surveys in 1980s again in Vancouver and Victoria for example um, it's pretty hard to access roof, rooftops to do an adequate census. So we thought a drone would be a really good way to do that. And then in the city of Victoria, birds are so habituated to things flying over them with this being a major aerodrome, we, we knew it wouldn't disturb them. So um, yeah, we, we wanted to ask whether the population had uh, increased in the city and indeed it has in Victoria, but not by a lot, you know, there were sort of uh, a few dozen here in the 1980s when they were surveyed from the ground and from rooftops and we found about 350 of them with another another colony. So there's probably, um, you know, sort of 450 to 500 in the city of Victoria. So they've increased, but not enough to explain the population decline that we've seen at their, their natural colonies. There's just been a bit of a, a shift. I don't know if you want to talk about Vancouver, Ed. Yeah, I'll just jump in on that because so Luis and I have uh, kind of a follow-up papers uh, in the works. Uh, being written right now, um, also with, with uh, Wilson Chow, um, a student that I've been working with, um, but looking at the Vancouver situation, so we haven't used drones in Vancouver, um, relying more on uh, surveys by, by eye and just finding the right vantage points, but, uh, but that work we've seen a similar type of finding, so certainly compared to the surveys that were done in the 80s, it seems like it's pretty reasonable that the urban population has increased. Um, so our current estimates are about, uh, I think about 1900 nests in the actual city of Vancouver. If you look over the whole lower mainland, that's going to be uh, probably at least 2,500, 3,000. Um, but uh, 
certainly that increase is nowhere near enough to account for the overall declines in the Salish Sea um, that, uh, that Louise studied um, earlier. So there is an increase, but um, it's not like all those gulls that seem to have disappeared just kind of moved into the city at all. Right. You know, that's, that's something that's being seen in other parts of the world too. So in, in Europe, you know, na native or sorry, natural populations, so-called natural populations nesting on, on offshore islands are declining and then urban numbers are increasing. And I think there's a little bit of a perception perhaps that if they're nesting in urban environments, then they're the ones like stealing your French fries or, you know, going to the garbage dump, but that's not necessarily the case. Correct, Louise? Or, or Ed, whoever. Yeah, go ahead. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, we haven't done individual tracking studies of these birds, but it, it's it's more or less one population around Victoria, you know, where, where we're doing this, doing some of this work. They're nesting very close to the city on offshore islands, and then they're nesting in the city. You can tell that they're feeding, they're, they're feeding in more or less the same place because the birds on their offshore islands are bringing fish to their chicks like sand lance and herring, and the ones on the rooftops are bringing fish, fish to their chicks as well. Great. Um, can we talk a little bit about their intelligence? I, 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 you touched on it already, Louise, and they are incredibly intelligent birds. And some of the, the things that came out in um, the story that we did was, you know, about their very precise timing uh, to, to, you know, to go to, to places where there may be food, like a school playground and things like this. What are some other surprising things that people may, or just fascinating things about that shows their intelligence, that are good demonstrations of their intelligence? Do you have a, do you want to answer that? Yeah, do you want to answer? I, I, have an, I have an anecdote as well. Um, well, uh, I'll, I'll give a anecdote for sure. Um, so I think that, so one thing we definitely often associate with intelligence is kind of um, the, complexity of social relationships, complexity of family relationships. And we haven't really formally studied this yet, but certainly in the, the five or six, uh, maybe seven now years that I've been kind of systematically observing gulls in Vancouver and certain certain pairs you can quite easily um, track uh, just uh, just by eye themselves. Um, you, you, you can see that these, these goals develop individual personalities and they have individual behaviors that they reserve for other individuals, say for their particular partner. Um, they, goals tend to, like most seabirds, tend to uh, partner up for life. Um, so you see this and you see also they have particular ways that they, um, that they respond and react to their young. They also tend to, so it, takes, it takes our goals here about six or seven weeks to from when they hatch from the egg to when they fledge and go off and fly on their own. And a lot of people kind of think that that's it. But uh, similar to the crows around here, actually, um, from what I've seen um, is, is that actually these, these uh, large babies kind of stick around for a long time, even all the way through the winter into the next spring um, and learn quite a bit from parents. I mean, I've seen parents basically teaching them how to fish, how to kind of pull apart the meaty pieces from dead fish on beaches, um, giving them crabs, live crabs, to kind of then figure out how to consume uh, without getting pinched. So to me, that, that really indicates um, a, a lot of intelligence and a lot of foresight, um, the ability to kind of teach your young these types of things. Um, so I've certainly seen that. Louise? Yeah, I think a, a couple of examples I, I've seen of um, using things like tools or some sort of problem solving abilities. One, a lesser one is their, their use of gravity as a tool. So probably most people on the coast have seen gulls take things like clams and drop them on a hard surface to smash them open so they can, so they can eat them. So that's, you know, that's somewhat trivial, but it, it did require some learning and you can kind of see those behaviors spreading through populations as well as individual animals learn about them. But one of, one of the um, observations that I had that really impressed me, is, impressed their intelligence on me was I was observing a pair on, or at a rooftop nest from, from a window that was overlooking this nest. And it was a, an extremely hot um, early summer day, not quite as hot as it's been here lately with this heat wave, but very hot, like deleteriously. So do these little chicks that were in a nest. The chicks were probably 
you know, less than a week old, they're little tiny things. And they were on the nest with the parent and obviously, you know, quite distressed from the heat, the parent was panting and so on. And then the parent hopped down from the nest over the parapet of the roof to something else that was sort of, you know, uh, half a meter below or 30 centimeters below down to where there was shade. And the parents started, he or she, both parents take care of the chicks, started actually calling to the chicks to come down into the shade where they were. And so that requires some, you know, some making of connections, one that shade is cooler, which most animals know, but also being able to realize that if they called the chicks down to the shade, that they would be doing better and that they would survive this, this heat wave event. So that's uh, an observation I thought was pretty interesting. That's great, thank you. So we are getting a lot of questions. So I think I'm gonna start with the audience questions. So um, I don't wanna miss any or try not to miss anybody. Um, so I think you touched on this already, Louise, but maybe we'll just just clarify it for this uh, person. What, where do the gulls raise their chicks in the city? Like what, where are they looking for nesting? What are they looking for in a nesting habitat? Is it any different than, I mean, my, so I'll let you answer that part. Where, where are they nesting and why? <laughs> Yeah, um, well, one of the interesting things to me is that there's there's a little bit of a difference in what they're choosing um, between cities, apparently, at least Ed's seeing different, slightly different use in Vancouver, and he can speak to that. But, you know, in general, they're choosing fairly flat roofs. There are a few individuals that nest on, you know, the sloped roof with a, uh, what would it be, a gable or something coming out so they can nest in the angle between the chimney and the, and the slope roof, that sort of thing. Sometimes they'll nest right in the middle of an open area out, out in the sun. Um, more often than not, they're nested up against, you know, if they're on a flat roof, they've got those little parapets. They're usually off in the, the corner where there's, you know, a little bit of uh, shelter from the wind and probably uh, some shade as well. And, and as predators, I suppose, is a big, they're trying to avoid predators in what, whatever way they can. I mean... <laughs> Sure, they, they are. They're, they're, they're certainly safer from terrestrial predators. You know, river otters eat them at their natural colonies around here. That's not going to happen off up on a rooftop in the city. Yeah. Um, I suspect raccoons can get up onto some roofs. One of their main predators here is bald eagles. And, and people, um, we like to speculate that they are further removed from predators here. But having said that, and, and again, Ed will probably come on, comment on this too, um, they do get depredated by eagles on rooftops. And in fact, in my neighborhood just last night, went out for a walk when it was cool at sunset. And I heard the gulls giving their, they have a particular eagle alarm call, heard the neighborhood gulls alarm calling. And I was looking for the eagle and caught a glimpse of it low among, down on, uh, among some roofs and then saw it again. And I realized it was actually rooftop hopping going after gull eggs. So it's, this is one of the local breeding bald eagles. And it's apparently it seems like new behavior. It's learning this and all the neighborhood gulls were gathered together and, and uh, attacking it, mobbing it, trying to drive it off from these nesting wow. areas. Yeah, we've definitely seen this in Vancouver too. And uh, especially like downtown Vancouver, right next to Stanley Park there. And there are several, I believe there are four bald eagle nests in Stanley Park. Um, so it's, it's pretty regularly actually this dynamic back and forth. Um, and one, one interesting aspect about, you know, where, where gulls are seeming to, pre to prefer to use uh, which buildings um, that's come out of you know, our, our, our current work um, is it seems like, so, I mean, taller structures are nice because they, they provide more protection from terrestrial predators and really provide more isolation from humans too. Um, but they kind of don't want to necessarily be too tall of structures because if they're too tall of structures, then you're, you could speculate it, we could speculate it anyway, that, you know, you might be kind of sticking out more like a sore thumb to a, an overhead eagle that's looking to predate. So um, they, there seems to be kind of a balance um, that gulls are kind of somehow um, maybe organically moving towards. Um, but, uh, but, but there are definitely a lot of complicated features of the urban environment um, that the gulls seem to one way or another uh, be taking advantage of to kind of maximize their ability to reproduce. Great, thanks. Um, okay, we have a bird physiology question about um, how uh, can a seagull or a gull get a whole sea star down in one gulp or, you know, or it doesn't, it's not one gulp, I think it's like ah, getting down uh, in a few um, peristaltic uh, contractions or something, but, or something that's much bigger than their head, like what, how, how can they possibly do that? 
Louise, do you want to try that one or answer that one? Yeah, I mean, I've, I've observed them doing this and it's pretty impressive. They, they just seem to sit there with the, if, if anyone hasn't seen a gull on the coast doing this themselves with the, the bird just sitting there on the beach looking pretty uncomfortable as it's got half a large sea star hanging out of its mouth. Um, do, a, do a search for a picture of it. It's, it's pretty impressive. But uh, yeah, they just seem to wear down the sea stars of, of defenses. You know, they just, they they have their bill completely wide open and the sea star is sitting there. And I, I assume they're just waiting until it, you know, slightly relaxes and then they choke down a bit more of it and, and so on until they get the whole thing in. And then they're just sitting around looking really uncomfortable with a large sea star in their proventriculus for a while. And they they can't actually, time. yeah. what's that? I can, it can take a long time. I've, I've, I've watched one do for more than like an hour and a half, just waiting for <laughs> The, the, the right angle, the, the uh, sea star just kind of stopped moving around, but eventually they get them down, yeah. Is there anything unique in their morphology though, like of the jaw or the, you know, like a snake can kind of detach? Of, of the bill? Yeah. yeah. Or, yeah. I, I don't, I I don't know. Yeah. yeah. I, don't, I don't think so. Yeah. Okay. It's just persistence. <laughs> yeah, definitely persistent. Yes, absolutely. Yeah. It must be worth it, I guess. <laughs> must be delicious <laughs> to a gull. Or, or perhaps not. Yeah. <laughs> perhaps there's nothing nothing better around for them to eat. True. Yeah. Or there is somebody who studied them, that at Simon Fraser University and I think was hypothesizing that it maybe had to do with some uh, parasite management for the gull. Oh, interesting. Huh. Um, so somebody uh, has asked, is their decline correlated with forage fish abundance? So I guess that's going to depend on the species. But in your study, um, what have you found as far as the relationship between the gulls um, population and forage fish? Yeah, so that was one of, uh, one of our research questions um, sort of 10 years ago. And I used stable isotope analysis, which is sort of a, a chemical analysis of um, gull feathers. So that was where the, the museum specimens came in as I went and collected feathers from museum specimens or asked, asked mu museum curators to, to collect them for me from around North America and Europe. Uh, because of course, Glaucus wing gulls shot here, went to collections around the world. Right. With this time series of feathers from 1860 to the present for the species um, did this analysis and looked at how um, their diet had changed over time. And it just showed that there was, you know, on average, birds are eating less fish now than they were 150 years ago. Um, and, and the population has declined. And we do know, so, so you know, we've, we've made connections based on all these different lines of evidence. So we do know that Gulls need fish to do well. It's been a few studies that show that gulls that feed their chicks all fish or mostly fish are much more successful than pairs that are feeding their young garbage. Those are bad quality parents and they don't usually rear many chicks. Um, here in this part of the world, um, I've talked more about declining availability of forage fish um, because, for example, there's studies that show that the herring spawn period, well, we know the herring spawn period in the Strait of Georgia is contracting. It used to start really early and end quite late, and now it's in a narrow window. There used to be bigger populations of things like ulican here. Um, other fish that don't really occur here anymore are quite rare. And so there used to be quite a wide window of times when gulls could eat fish, and that window has shrunk over time. Add to that with something else that's correlated that um, came out of well came out of your work originally, Louise, and then we've seen in, in our in our follow up work together is um, just uh, d the decline in fecundity of gulls overall. And so uh, laying fewer eggs, um, they've you know typically laid three eggs historically anyway. Um, nowadays we're seeing it's actually somewhat more typical for them to only lay two eggs, and um, this certainly seems like it's reasonable that there can be a connection with this. Um, but uh, yeah, so, so there are many correlates that are concerning, um, I would say, with the health of the overall population. Yeah, yeah. And, and lots of literature, lots of research that makes that connection between um, diet quality and diet quantity and the number of eggs that are laid, for example. So yeah, clear, lots, of, lots, of, lots of lines of evidence that support that, that hypothesis. Great. 
Um, I guess this question is sort of about their intelligence and ability to learn. Do you have any insight, any insight into how the birds have changed their tactics in dealing with humans? Um, so I guess I can I can maybe start with this. Um, I mean, I think that uh, I, I, I always say that gulls and humans are so similar and this is part of the reason why people don't like them. Um, well, also part of the reason why people like me like gulls. Um, but I think a lot of times gulls don't necessarily care what we think or what's comfortable for us. Um, so if they see what looks to them like an attractive nesting spot in say downtown Vancouver, they're gonna do it even if it's two feet away from your bedroom window, um, which obviously can create problems. Um, but I mean, of course we've seen um, gulls capitalize on availability of our trash of, of human generated food, refuse, whatever. Um, so that's, that's been well-documented and well just observed by individuals. But in terms of like where they're nesting um, and where they're choosing to reproduce, um, I don't know. It, it, I, I think it's I think it's hard to make um, to make exact connections. Um, certainly, we're seeing them more in the city for, for for a variety of reasons. But whether or not they're actually really thinking about how they're interacting with us, I, I, I I'm skeptical of that. I don't know. Luis might have a well, in terms of changing their tactics in dealing with us and eating, I mean, it goes back to the, their diet. It goes, it goes back to the fact that they are um, innovators and they're, um, I don't know if I'd say they're neophiles as in lovers of new things. They're certainly not neophobic. No. So, you know, you see, you see certain birds like crows and gulls to a similar extent really like investigating new things. You know, if they see a new thing, they'll fly in and look at it. They'll make sure there's no danger. Eventually they'll come down and check it out. And that's, that's part of innovating and, and using that lack of fear of new things to learn. So, you know, you can, you see gulls do things like, um, well, there was, there's one of our collaborators in Europe has done some research on looking at their behavior, similar to the Bristol study. And she's found, for example, there's a, favored spot on a lamppost outside of, I, I can't remember what it is, a bakery or something. And the same bird comes there every day and wants to hang out there so that it can, it can take food from people. Um, there's a, uh, a, a fun post on a subreddit that I found um, that somebody's posted and it's from the UK and it's somebody sitting at a table at a pub um, filming it, filming this situation with a gull sitting up on a lamppost. And they obviously know this is, this is happening. So this is obviously something that this gull does all the time. They're sitting there waiting for it, narrating this story. The gull's up on the post. Someone's walking along, walks into the frame, holding a pie. And the gull comes down and grabs the pie. And like it, much like a starfish, it manages to scarf this large pie down all at once. So, you know, that's, that's obviously a learned behavior as well. So again, they use that kind of intelligence to um, keep changing how they deal with humans. There, there's a question here about, are they very social? And it also makes me think like, are they, I don't know how long they, their chicks stay with them or if they fledge and then they're on their own. Like, is there any uh, teaching of young or teaching one another? But and this falls into like, how social are they? I mean, I, this, is, this is certainly something that I've observed pretty regularly. I, I'm not aware of this being explicitly studied with gulls. I mean, there was, there was a little bit of work um, in mid 20th century around this type of stuff, but um, uh, I, I'm not aware of any like real systematic studies, not like with say with, with uh, corvids, with crows or ravens, but certainly, I mean, you can you can witness this. There's quite a diversity it seems like, um, and it might have something to do with the, the age of the parents, but certainly, um, certainly young, they're not necessarily like like uh, some songbirds where they leave the nest and then pretty quickly, maybe a week after they're kind of on their own. Um, oftentimes the young are kind of following around the parents. I've even seen this extending over multiple breeding seasons. Um, occasionally a, a pair will take a take a breeding season off. They, they usually return to their same nest site. Uh, we actually have estimates on this. About 80 to 90% of the time, gulls will return to their, right, at least in the cities, um, in the city of Vancouver. 
Um, so they'll return pretty much every year and uh, lay new eggs, raise new young, but occasionally pairs will take a year off. And I've noticed that among those pairs in those years, their last year's fledglings seem to still kind of hang around and um, beg for food and look for guidance. So um, there's, there's, there are potentially some very strong connections there. Uh, again, they haven't been really explicitly studied that well. Um, but uh, but we, we've also observed and this has been slightly documented, at least in Western gulls in the 1970s, I believe, um, that uh, gulls can tend, sometimes have somewhat of an extended family network where maybe if there are nearby pairs, um, they kind of have somewhat of a reciprocity tree type agreement with each other. Um, and one, even though these pairs might not necessarily be closely related, um, they might feed one another's chicks occasionally. Um, they might uh, scare off an intruder that's in a neighboring territory. So not necessarily working super closely together, but kind of uh, in a, a slight treaty type situation. Um, I've certainly observed that anecdotally here, um, but, uh, uh, but it's been documented more, more clearly in Western goals for the South along the coast in California. Please. Yeah, in terms of more broadly as species, you know, most gulls are colonial nesters. Um, some of them are in massive colonies, some just nest in loose aggregations of just a few pairs of birds. Um, but that's, you know, that's, that's a very social behavior, this colonial nesting, partly presumably because nesting habitat is limited, they want to be on islands, but then there's also the fact that they're swamping predators by nesting colonially. So that's one of the interesting questions to us is the, the issue of coloniality in these, um, what we call urban colonies. So when they're nesting in the city, it's, it's not, at least around here, it's not very common to see them in a colony that looks like a colony on an island, you know, where, there's, where there are dozens of birds or hundreds of birds in one place all crammed in together. It's more like that there are just a couple of birds on a nest here and a, a, on a rooftop and a couple of birds on a rooftop over there and so on. So their, their definition or their approach to coloniality seems quite different in a city situation. And we're kind of interested in trying to find out why that might be. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Thanks. Um, we have a young reader, Maya, and she's concerned about plastic getting into um, the chicks' stomachs. Um, Louise, do you want to speak to that? How it would affect its, their development? Yeah, that's a great question. Um, marine plastics and plastics in the environment are a, a huge concern and it's growing. Um, in fact, the, the first paper I ever wrote as an undergraduate was on looking at um, plastic waste in seabird stomachs. Um, perhaps less of a concern for gulls though, I have to say, because um, you know most seabirds, like these pictures that you see uh, in the popular media of albatrosses from Midway Atoll, for example, that are really heartbreaking of a, you know, a, a pile of plastic it, it, surrounded by the, the decaying carcass of an albatross chick. That sort of thing is happening because albatrosses don't really regurgitate except when they're feeding their chicks. So they're giving a huge, you know, multi-month load of plastic to their chicks when they're first feeding them. Gulls, you know, they eat a lot of hard things. They eat mussels and crabs and clams and so on. So they regularly are regurgitating these boluses of, you know, crab claws and clam shells and so on. So that presumably allows them to, you know, regurgitate plastic or will allow them to regurgitate plastic as well and not just... Um, wait until they're feeding their chicks to do that. So that's a, sorry, the bolus is a way of ex getting that out of their system. They're not, that's totally like, like an owl pellet kind of thing. They're just getting- I was getting just gonna say like an owl yeah. pellet. Okay. Oh, I didn't know that. Okay, so they just- by the, by the bird okay. in these little elongated pellets. Okay, all right. But you do see plastic in sometimes. So yeah, I'm sure they do feed their chicks plastic sometimes, but it's not like a month, month's load that's been building up in the okay. bird. Okay. And things like that. Very good question, Maya. That mm -hmm. was great. Um, let's see. So a few questions about uh, dialect and conversation. Do, do gulls have song dialects? Do they have songs? Uh, and what can you say about gull language? They seem very conversational. 
Ed, do you want to take a crack at that for starters? Well, um, well as, as Louise mentioned before, you know, they, they do have separate and distinct calls um, for different types of predators or different types of alarm calls. So there's a very distinct uh, bald eagle call, um, which, uh, which you can identify pretty readily here uh, on Vancouver and Victoria. Um, th there are others as well. So I've, so again, I, ha I haven't studied this or seen this studied really that explicitly yet, but um, they, they have extremely good eyesight. And so they can recognize their partners from very far away. Um, and they have what I would say are distinct calls, or at least some of them have distinct calls um, to greet or uh, recognize or signal um, to their mated partner. Um, I've certainly observed this anecdotally. Um, and, and, and you see this is just how they react too. So even if they hear this particular call it might all sound the same to us, um, but you can see the reaction of the, of the mate, of the paired individual. And so clearly there's, there's something there, whether you wanna call it a different type of song or inflection or word, I'm not sure what the proper language would be for it. Um, but there seems to be quite a variety there that I think would be fascinating to study more explicitly, but I don't think it really has been yet. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I'm, I'm interested in uh, looking into that at some point too, recording their different alarm calls because they, they do have different alarm calls for, for lesser predators, mm -hmm. um, by which I mean things like Cooper's, Cooper's hawks, things that they may be alarmed by but aren't necessarily that threatened by. Um, they have a particular, particular call they use when, when humans are in the colony and so on. I mean, a lot of, a lot of birds have alarm calls, but it seems that... Um, something like a gull has, has more vocal variety. Um, and, you know, their, their language or their calls are, are an intrinsic part of their behaviors that have been studied by, you know, ethologists as they were called back in the day. Um, you know, the, the behavior, behavioralist Nico Tinbergen won the Nobel Prize for I think, physiology and medicine along with, um, uh, Von Frisch and Conrad Lorenz, and they it was the first first time anyone had won it for for studying animal behavior. Uh, and Tim Bergen was studying gulls; he was studying herring gulls, and so he studied those very uh, stereotyped behaviors that they do: the head tossing when they're greeting each other, the the long calls, and so that their physical behaviors are very entrained, and they have vocal. Uh, behaviors that go along with those or vocal sounds that go along with them very often. Uh, and, and then, you know, they also have, um, I always think of their, um, their attack call, which is pr particularly memorable if you're, if you're somebody who's studying them and working with them around their nests, they become very protective um, right around the time that the chicks are hatching actually. So for bird, bird eggs, you don't just have an egg that's sitting there and then there's a chick. The chick is obviously growing in the egg. And then for a couple of days before it hatches, the chick actually is communicating with the parent. So you can hear it peeping in the egg and it starts pipping the egg. And as soon as the parent starts to hear the chick pip, peeping in the egg, they become much more vigilant, much more um, aggressive and proactive in, in protecting their nest. So around that time, they start, if you're working with them, they start using this horrible screeching call as, as you approach the nest and fly right at you and often defecate on you defensively and so on. So um, yeah, that, that call is associated in my mind with being um, pooped on by gulls. <laughs> Mine, mine as well, but they're just protecting their young. So yeah. I don't hold yeah. Sure. Um, just so everybody knows, we're getting, we still have some questions and we can, we're going to stay live for a little while longer. It's 1215 now, but um, I like to just keep going um, if that's okay with you too. Yeah. Okay. Um, so we have a few questions around um, Bert, like how to deter them, this sort of thing. And I had a question about how can we be better neighbors. Um, so one thing, how one is asking, one person is asking, what's the best way to deter gulls from nesting on your roof? Um, and I thought there was another one, but just sort of around that being a good neighbor, like architecturally, what instead of looking at them as like 
bad, you know, pest, like how can we, we're encouraging them to be in their cities. We're providing space for them. So what's, a, a, how can we work with that, Ed? So, so yeah, this is something I'm, I'm really interested in in particular and some of our recent work is really trying to nail down some of the specifics around these things. Um, certainly, first of all, it depends on the species. So what works for, or seems to work uh, for Glaucus wing gulls here in the Salish Sea is probably not necessarily going to work, say, over in the UK with herring gulls, um, or even on the East Coast in Halifax uh, or St. John with herring gulls. Um, but, uh, but over here, there are certainly some things that we know can be done. Um, like, like you mentioned, Adrian, I think a lot of it has to come to better, better architectural foresight and architectural planning. Um, you'll see often in the city people for some reason realize that there's a nest up there one year and then they try to install this kind of black netting um, in future years. This, this netting is not a great idea. I would really like to see it uh, just completely eliminated because it's, it's first of all, it's going to deteriorate. Um, so it's not a permanent solution at all. Um, and secondly, it, it, can, it can create a lot of problems just by ensnaring uh, gulls or other birds that happen to land. They're still going to try to land on that particular spot. Um, so it, it's, it, that is going to create problems and it's not a permanent solution by any means. Um, gulls are, as, as I think I mentioned before, they're, they're quite persistent um, with returning to successful nesting sites once they have been successful there. So um, if, if you really want to make change, it, it, it seems like through some of, some of our work right now being done, it seems like one of the best things might be to actually kind of structurally change a particular rooftop. And this can be something as simple as making it more uh, more of a complex shape on the top. So it seems at least around Vancouver here, gulls really do not like to nest on, they like to nest on flat rooftops, kind of gentle slopes, nothing too sloped, um, nothing too complex with weird bumps or uh, ridges, too many of these things. So, I mean, I, I, I'd like to kind of see maybe more of that um, employed. I think that could maybe be more of a permanent solution than one that's not going to harm a gull or any other, any other bird. And, you know, on the same token, I think we can also say, you know, these, these birds are, they're, they're here. This is their, their native home. This is really kind of their natural habitat, even though we've converted it into an urban environment. So, you know, they do have a right to be here. So I think it would be nice to also see some encouragement and some, some incentivizing of kind of creating suitable habitat for them in the urban environment that is not going to cause problems with people. So in areas where it's not going to be right next to somebody's window or they're not going to, you know, fall into some kind of air conditioning vent and you're going to have to deal with this as a building manager or something. I think there's a lot of easy things that can be done, but it has to start to get onto people's minds at the construction and design phase uh, of these things. Um, the city of Vancouver could help um, by incentivizing these types of things. So um, there's, there's a lot of structural things we can do, um, but we haven't really seen that actively pursued yet. And yeah, just I'll, I'll add as a reminder that um, they are as wild birds protected under the Federal Migratory Birds Convention Act in Canada and similar act, Companion Act in the States. And it's actually illegal to harass them or to remove their nests with eggs or chicks. So you do need a permit for that, that sort of thing. Um, yeah, Ed's, Ed's made a lot of great points. There, are, there is something that's been trialed on the cruise ship terminal building here in Victoria, which is a series of wires that are sort of a couple of meters apart above a roof that gulls were nesting on in, in a, a tourist area. And it sort of worked, you know, most of the birds didn't come back, sort of 30% of them did. And now a couple of years later, about 50% of the original numbers are there. So as Ed said, they're, they're, uh, they're very persistent. And, fake uh, owls don't work. No, fake owls no. don't work at all. They but will I, actually nest right next to fake owls. The building that the magazine offices are on, uh, we also are on the top floor and our the Hakka Institute staff sent me some pictures yesterday of the owl that they put up there. And yeah, no, <laughs> they were persistent and it was just fine for the girls. Yeah, I just wanted to make a broader point that too that maybe fits into your Birdopolis theme, and that's um, that, that city planners and citizens should be thinking more broadly about how do we create city environments that are 
friendly to birds. So for example, Vancouver has Vancouver bird strategy and it has the urban forest strategy, which is important, not, not so much for gulls, but for other species of birds, we need to be thinking about how can we create cities that allow birds to use them and increasing the urban forest um, canopy is one way of doing that, particularly for migratory birds that use that canopy as they're migrating through for stopover, for foraging and resting, that sort of thing. Um, and as a byproduct of that, helping to cool cities as, as the climate heats up and yes. then thinking about things like um, how do we get, mitigate urban uh, window strikes or window, bird window strikes in city areas? All those are sort of broader considerations around birds in cities. Yeah, another along those lines, somebody's mentioning a, a education campaign. Like I spoke, it's, it sounds like there's one in Vancouver that's actively discouraging people from feeding gulls but there isn't an equivalent here in Victoria. I mean, that seems like a no brainer, but are people purposely feeding gulls or is it more just like they're, they're leaving out attractants or both probably? It's probably both. Yeah. I mean, certainly Granville Island and Vancouver gets all the press um, tourists feeding gulls, but um, I, I don't think it's a, it's a particularly um, uh, epidemic or anything, but I mean, you know, you see them going into trash cans. I mean, they're very resourceful. So yeah. Uh, we leave our trash around and don't secure it, they're, they're going to get into it. That's yeah. right. It's pretty straightforward. Yeah. All right. Now we've had a couple very questions we've had for a long time. So I don't want to forget these. We, we have some ID tip. People are looking for identification tips. So uh, Barry asks about uh, giving some tips on how to recognize individual birds. He says, we have crows that visit a pond in our backyard and we want to be able to know and identify individuals, but they all look the same to us. So he's talking about crows, but I, I suppose, you know, it could be how do, what, are, what are some tips for getting to know the birds that are in your, your homescape? <laughs> so I, I can speak a little bit to that. So I, I will say that it's, there's not always going to be a way that you can. Um, there are certainly some individuals that I think, i inferring that they're the same that I've watched for years, but I can't be sure. Other times you get lucky, um, a, a particular type of discoloration. I remember this particular gull that I watched for about five years. Uh, when it molted into, into her breeding plumage, had just kind of a, a smudgy gray patch on, on her forehead. Um, it's quite easy to identify. Um, others might have, you, you wanna look for the real small fine features. So another gull I remember had a very puffy, bright pink eye ring. It was very, very noticeable. And once once I actually noticed that, which wasn't until about a year and a half of, of watching this, this, uh, this gull, uh, but then it became obvious and very easy to, to track this individual um, around the city. So you really got to focus on those, those little differences. Take lots of pictures and zoom in and see if you can find some of these things. Because um, in general, it's, it's quite hard, I think, in my experience. Yeah, unless you're working with them in the colony and then the same pair are coming back to the same nest all the time, obviously. But you can look at behaviors as well. So... A, a, a pretty extreme example is that um, a, a former friend and colleague of mine uh, used to feed a particular gull, a herring, every day. And his, his wife was, you know, kind of a participant in this. And unfortunately, he, uh, he died and uh, the gull kept coming back. And now his wife feeds the same gull a herring every day, and it's it's a way of her connecting with, with her husband. How long would they live? How long? But I mean, I guess it's going to vary between species and and various things. But what's a, is there an average lifespan of gulls? The uh, the longest record for glaucous wing gulls is from a bird that was banded near Victoria as a chick. So we know how old it was when it was banded, and it was found. Um, it was recovered dead at just over 37 years. So that's incredibly long lived, you know, seabirds are, are the longest lived wild birds anyway. Um, but, you know, obviously that is not going to be the longest lived individual in the population. So that's, that's quite remarkable. Um, it's not, it's not up there with um, the albatross that people call wisdom, who's at least 70 years of age right. and yeah. in chicks and yeah. in the Hawaiian islands, but it is very long lived. Yeah, great. Um, somebody's uh, Nadine is asking about a good suggest online resource for goal vocalizations and behavior. She'd love to learn more about their interactions with one another. 
Oh, a great place for vocalizations is eBird. Yeah. And uh, the associated links with Cornell, Cornell Lab of Ornithology. There are uh, a lot of individual um, recordings of, you know, every species imaginable on there, including gulls. And then the uh, website Xenocanto, X-E-N-O, I think hyphen C-A-N-T-O. So Songs of the Others is the repository, a database for um, bird recordings. So you can, you can find some obscure ones on there actually. Great, thank you. Um, this kind of came up, but why do gulls dive bomb people? Because they can. <laughs> uh, I, I think it's the same, it's the same type of type of answer people ask. Why, why, do, why do they poop on us? Why do they try to poop on me? It's like, well, most of the time they're probably not. Um, certainly if they're defending their, their nest or they perceive you as a threat around their nest or their young, then sure, they, they're, they might do this just to, uh, to protect their young. But I don't know. I, I, it, this is somewhat species specific because it seems like in the UK, at least, um, their, their herrings and perhaps their lesser blackbacks are a bit more aggressive than our glaucous wings. Um, so, so it is somewhat species specific, but if, I mean, be aware, you know, if, if, if you're hearing a bunch of gulls call, and especially here in, say, in Vancouver, you're walking over a bridge, a lot of times these bridges are actually on the same level as nests. You might not even realize that those nests are there. And this can agitate the gulls. So if you're hearing them and they seem troubled and they seem to be kind of dive bombing you or hovering overhead, um, maybe just don't stay in the area because they might have vulnerable chicks nearby. That'd be my advice. Great, thank you. So I think we better wrap up now. Um, I'll just give each of you a last word if there's something you feel like you really wanted everybody to think about when they see gulls or, or, or just anything that you want to add as your parting words for our viewers. Uh, I guess I'll go first, with Louise, the last word. Um, I, with, with me, I just wanna, I just wanna emphasize that, you know, these, these all of these goals, pretty much no matter where you are, um, these goals are, are native to your environment. And, you know, they were likely here long before any humans were, before we were, before our cities. Um, so, you know, they, they have a right to be here and they are quite beautiful and intelligent. Um, they can create problems, but, you know, we can create problems too as humans. So I, I would really just like to encourage people to, to kind of treat them with respect and um, try, to, try to be a little interested in them. They, they are just trying to um, live and raise their young and survive. So um, I think we should try to respect that. Please. Great, thank you. Yeah, I, I, I completely agree. And to build on, on that, um, there's a, a story that I like uh, about the writer and artist, John Berger. And uh, in his, I be, believe it's in Ways of Seeing, he wrote about going to the London Zoo and then realizing while he was there that the reason that people go to zoos is not to see animals, but to be seen by them, right? It's about the sort of primordiality of that experience. And, you know, most of the world's populations now live in cities and we, most of us don't, most people don't have a chance to interact with wild animals very much. And uh, gulls really give us the opportunity to do that. You know, when you've been seen by a gull, you really know you've been seen by it and it can, Sometimes if you open yourself up to the experience, it can be a bit thrilling. So I echo Ed's uh, comment about just respecting and enjoying them. Great. Well, that's a wonderful way to end things today. Well, thank you so much, Ed and Louise, for, for joining us. That was a really great hour. I think we have a few more questions, but we're just going to have to cut it off there. I just want to remind everybody that this is taped, so it will be available on YouTube to, YouTube to share with uh, people that weren't able to join us today. And also encourage you to take a look at the magazine website, hackeyemagazine.com, and uh, sign up for our newsletter that gives you um, an update on everything we've been up to that week. So take care, and I hope things cool off for those of you in the Pacific Northwest. We're going through a very uh, unusual heat wave for us, so we're all kind of, um, if this was yesterday, I think the three of us would just, well, I know for sure I would be just dripping, so I'm very thankful that it's a bit cooler today. So anyways, take care. Thanks for joining us. Thanks, Thanks. everyone. Bye-bye.